Hi, I'm Rory Kennedy. Hi, I'm Mark Bailey. And you are watching the Break It Down show. We are big fans of the work of Rory Kennedy, who, if I'm counting correctly, this is your 22nd picture as a director or project as a director. Can't really call it a picture. Is that right? I have not been counting lately, but um, I've definitely made a lot of documentaries. over. Yeah, the so it's up there. And we've uh, frequent uh, viewers of the show have seen you on before. And we've talked pretty exhaustively in our last visit about your body of work. But the last time we talked to you was right after Above and Beyond NASA's, NASA's Journey to Tomorrow. Um, in any case, I'm going to encourage everybody to look at whatever in your work they can find and get their hands on because we've loved a bunch of those films and uh today though we're talking about your latest project which comes out on april 1st for hbo and uh and warner brothers and it is called the synanon fix so i'm going to ask both of you and you can uh answer uh, one after the other why this topic what was fascinating about this topic well, it's this is a story that has largely been untold. Um, we live in Los Angeles County, and Synanon started in Santa Monica in 1958. Um, it started as a drug treatment program. It was the first treatment program that helped heroin addicts. And it was the first residential program in the United States. Um, it turned into a, a kind of communal living environment and then over the years evolved into what many consider to be a cult. Um, although that is remains a question as to whether it was indeed a cult or not. Um, we were fascinated with this story because it, um, impacted so many people, you know, probably 20,000 plus people went through Synanon. It really spawned the therapeutic community programs that we're familiar with today. Um, it was the beginning of all that. And it's also just a fascinating story. I mean, this was a, a program that started um, there was, there, they had, it was sort of founded on two pillars. One was you couldn't use any drugs or alcohol, and the other was no violence. And um, 20 years later, they had bought more firearms than anybody in the history of California, and they had an open bar in the facility. And so looking at this story and how it went from one extreme to the other in a couple decades and um, really understanding it from the people who live through it. There's no narrator in the film. It's really all um, the perspective of the people who had firsthand knowledge of, of living through Synanon, telling the story and how they came to make sense of this world um, is is pretty fascinating. We also had amazing footage and archive, and we felt like we could really tell a story that helped people understand what it was like to be in Synanon and live through it from the inside out. Mark, anything to add to that? Um, well, thanks, John. I, uh, you know, I would say that, um, it seems it seemed to us to be a very timely series, because I think if you kind of look out at the contemporary landscape today, um, well, generally the public right now there's a sort of current um, fascination in cults, in cult stories, um, and that I think part of that is this awareness of sort of leadership in charismatic leaders, and um, looking out at the world today and looking out at people at, 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 at various communities in, in different directions they might be taking. And so you see that sort of writ large in stories like Synanon, where you have a man like Chuck Dietrich, who initially starts out as, you know, a very committed service oriented, you know, dealing with a population of addicts that nobody else is willing to take on. And over time, 
you know, he starts to, he, he, he builds a community around it and takes that community on this sort of journey that, you know, kind of goes from healing to sort of, you know, horror on some level. And how does that happen? And um, that was, I think, uh, also part of our interest in it. I also appreciated how much it is uh, reflective of so much that's going on today, but also a period piece. And for anybody who had a preconceived notion of what Los Angeles was like in the 50s, this picture really makes, uh, I mean, it, a, a whole different image of Los Angeles emerges. And uh, I'm curious as to what came first. Did you um, find out about the story and find the characters or did you engage with characters who were able to um, help you to make the, the creative decision to have it be narrated by their individual stories? Well, we, Mark actually came to the story first through reading a book about uh, Art Pepper biography where he talked about going to Synanon. Um, and, you know, the truth is, is most of our documentaries, we, we don't have narrators and we really like to try to have that kind of immersive um, experience for the audience where they can really try to relate to what people are going through who are um, the on, on the front lines of any given either issue or story or whatever it is that we're tackling. Um, and we really felt like, you know, the, the, the people as we got to know them were so fascinating. I mean, part of what's so interesting about them is they're enormously relatable and, you know, you want to think, I, you know, when people go through these experiences, because, you know, in the extremes of sin and on, they were, there were forced abortions and forced vasectomies and people were shaving their heads, you know, it was, it was pretty extreme behavior, but they're enormously normal, you know, quote unquote, and, um, and are not unlike I think you and me and my husband and, you know, whoever. Um, so I think part of what was so fascinating is, is really trying to understand their perspective of how they came to land in Sinanon, why they stayed there and what motivated them and what drew them to it. And then, you know, why in the face of such, you know, extreme behavior, they didn't leave, right? Um, and I think, I mean, you know, I would say, as as you noted, I've made, you know, dozens of documentaries over my career. And I think on average, they've been like two hour interviews. Um, these averaged somewhere between seven and nine hours for each interview. Um, and you know, they were never boring. I mean, yeah. it, was, it was fascinating from like minute one until the end. And, um, and so it was really a, a wonderful experience for me to go on that kind of roller coaster, but also, you know, I think there was a way to tell this story that was much more sensationalist and really lean into the kind of, you know, quote unquote, cult like behaviors. But I think what drew us to it was that it was this really beautiful community in the beginning. It was interracial. It was forward thinking. It was helping drug addicts. It was helping these very marginalized, ostracized group of people that nobody else was, was looking out for in any meaningful way and doing something really aspirational, you know? Um, and then, there was money and power and other things in the mix as it got, you know, older in age and, and things deteriorated. And, you know, you can see that all over the course of the four hours and how that happens and what those factors are. And we found it enormously compelling. Mark, when this story originally came to you, did you envision it as a feature length documentary or as a series? Well, that's a good question. You know, I actually, it sort of marinated around and, and knocked around and 
my brain a lot and Roy and I would talk about it. And it, it was probably 10 years ago uh, when I read that book about art that he and his wife, Lori Pepper wrote. And, um, you know, back then there were fewer documentary series. It wasn't a format that's as popular now. Mm -hmm. And I think that as that, as, as you started to see more and more documentary series, and we started to think about subjects that would lend themselves to a series, this, you know, started to, to take shape. And so we really always conceived of it once we got into it as, as, oh, we're going to do this as a series and Synanon spanned, you know, 30 years. And yeah. so we've got four hours on those 30 years and it really was hard discipline, you know, killing all your darlings in terms of like mm. getting it down to that time. The subject, I mean, it, it really deserved to be a series and it had to be. And I just would also say, John, on your other question about sort of history, one of the things that we really liked about it and tried to do with the series and that you see throughout the different episodes is, you know, it begins in 1958 and in, in, in 1968, America is completely different than it was in 1958. And Synanon's completely different. And Chuck Dieterich is completely different. And the community there is. And so through Chuck's evolution and through Synanon's evolution, where it's constantly changing, it really mirrors America and California. And so that's like a great thread of the story that you see. And one of the kind of, and it was really necessary because when you try to understand what they're doing, oh, we're going to go up to, you know, West Marin and create a self-sustaining city, right? Yeah. You're like, what? But in 1970, 71, 72, people were taking those kinds of, you know, swings at things and were trying different alternative lifestyles. And so we felt that that was really a rich way to kind of interweave both, you know, America evolving Chuck and Synanon together in these threads. So do you think that there was a, a single tipping point where the corruptive factors that, that uh, Rory mentioned, the, the money coming in and, and all of the um, accolades building up and, and the realization that there was something going on there that was changing um, the the tide of of culture, especially around uh, addiction, was there a a, t a tipping point at which uh, things quote unquote went bad? Either of you? Um, do you want to you go? Well, I would say that there wasn't to me a a, a single tipping point that it was it 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 did have that sensation of, of kind of the frog in the water mm. um, for, for the people who were there where, you know, it was kind of, um, they would, he would, you know, mandate, Chuck Dietrich would mandate one thing. He would mandate, okay, we're all going to shave our heads. And then, you know, it started with where nobody's going to eat sugar and then we're all going to exercise and now we're going to shave our heads and, you know, then evolved into, we're going to have, you know, forced abortions and vasectomies and we're going to all change partners. And, you know, it, it, it kind of, and all of the mandates had kind of a rationale to them. Um, and similar, I mean, I think the, the thing that's, that's most, you know, tragic and difficult about the series is the treatment of the children. Right. So in the early days, the children were fo folded in and they had kind of this magical life on the beach and in Santa Monica and they were integrated. Um, I mean, they were in these spaces where there were people kicking and they would help them like with their, you know, while they're kicking people kicking are heroin kicking that heroin on yeah on the couch and you know they're throwing up in the buckets and the kids are taking the buckets and they're like part of this crazy wacky community Mark, you go ahead. okay speaking um, of crazy wacky community right on right on cue i think that um you know it's hard to know what sort of external factors 
impacted the changes that happened in Sinanon? And mm -hmm. I guess what we would look at is a kind of deterioration or a drifting radically off their original path, whether those were external things like wealth, right? Or, 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 or you know, and, and being imbued with power and, and, and things like that, or they were internal within Chuck, because Chuck also, and this is how it is like a cautionary tale about when you sort of a community pins its, its, its fortunes to sort of one individual. If that individual goes, you know, driving off the cliff, you go with it. And so Chuck's, I think, um, you know, he w was mentally ill and he, his wellness, you know, he, he lost his management of that. He lost his wife, Betty of, you know, several decades. He, 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 he lost his sobriety, you know, so all of these things happened within Chuck. And then also there were external factors. And I mean, I think Rory's right that it was gradual, but if you look at that metaphor, like when the water hits boil, I would kind of say that the water hit boil in the mid seventies around 1975, 1976, which was, you know, like 15 years into Sinanon's lifespan. I mean, Sinanon had been a very effective, innovative, much, much celebrated, groundbreaking rehabilitation and therapeutic community. And Sinanon had also become and transitioned into a pretty remarkable commune that was self-sustaining and independent and dynamic and, you know, in in that first 15 years, but it kind of turned in somewhere in the sort of mid 70s. So, Mark, is this? Oh, go ahead. Oh, go, go ahead, Pete. I, I was going to, one of the things that strikes me when you, when you see this stuff all building up in California is, you know, the, the social, social and cultural revolution. Is this part of it? What makes these things inevitable? I mean, there's so much of this stuff in California, Manson family, purple people leaders, people's temple. It's almost like it became a cult machine. Uh, if you're looking at it from the worst point of view, there's other great things that come out. But is this just kind of a product of the time, this um, this growth towards that that end of it? Or is this a flawed man who, you know, reaches his point where he can no longer handle? It? And was that inevitable? Well, I think with your charismatic leader, that instability is sort of baked into that, that part of what makes you so is a manic. I mean, Chuck was diagnosed as being manic depressive at the end and like that kind of manic change oriented behavior has a certain attractiveness to it. And so, you know, as one of the characters says, you know, charismatic leaders are good for 10, 20 years, but they always crash. Right. And you don't want to be sort of tethered to them when they do crash. But I, I also think Peter, that, 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 that point about the times in California, that the time and place are significant that the cultural revolution was a time when it was about exploration, inward exploration, social exploration, and you and, and you found people, whatever you wanted to call them, leaders, gurus, whatever, that were throwing out new ideas and different ways of living and communities formed around them. And Sinanon was one. And it happened to have a very interesting origin story as a rehabilitation center, right? But when it when it reached, you know, 68, 69, that's when, that's when non-addicts started joining and it grew exponentially and the wealth grew exponentially. And you had this non-addict community that was really turning it into something else that was to a large degree of time and place, I would say. Oh. Rory, I don't know if you want to chime in or. No, I think you captured it well. Okay. So because we have uh, things that we all can relate to about all of these characters. And I think that, you, you know, when you said that the characters are all ultra relatable, that's absolutely true. Even when you um, watch addicts, if you've never been through heroin addiction, you can still relate to desperation. You can still relate to hopelessness. And then you can relate to clinging on to something that can bring you some hope and, you know, climbing back and making a comeback. And then even in, in, Chuck's case, the charismatic leader, we all, um, you know, can relate to some degree to being um, in command of of a mission and and being that purposeful is the uh, the story itself. 
in its relatability, is it a, I, I have a hard time saying that it's just a, that it's a cautionary tale because somehow there remains hope in all of these characters who have made it out the other side. That's, that, that's really well said. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I think that um, there's one character um, who says that Sinanon is both a promising story and a cautionary tale. And that, you know, there was a lot of amazing things that um, Sinanon accomplished and it saved a lot of lives. And the people that Rory interviewed are fantastic. I mean, they're articulate, they're honest, they're, you know, raw, they're real. And so many, and, and they had, and they had a beautiful connection to each other and, and to their community. And that offers hope for, for possibility and connection and, and a kind of, you know, sharing of, of lives together as, you know, but it didn't end in a good place. And so that's the, but, uh, you know, I do think that, that, you know, looking at Synanon and particularly the first episode where we're really celebrating kind of this this vision and the success of it in those early years that, you know, at the core of it was the game, right, where they would have this kind of confrontational therapy and where, you know, it was an environment where that was really the heart of Synanon. And if anybody, if you had any issues with anybody, if they rubbed you the wrong way, if they didn't clean their dishes, if they said something that it was hurtful to you, I, I want to go game you, you know, and it could be your husband you get, and then 12 people get in a room and you have this confrontation you work it out and you talk it through. And, you know, I mean, I see the value of that today, you know, to be that honest. And I think that in addition to that, you're living in this community where you're deeply connected you know what everybody every single person i interviewed said you know the relationships that i have coming out of synanon are deeper are the most meaningful in my life are you know richer than anything i've ever been able to experience since and i do think that there is value in watching the series to understand what that means. And in today's environment where people are so, you know, they're kind of living, you know, they've got social media, they've, they're, they're working out of their homes, you know, there's a loneliness amongst people. And I think seeing this connection that they have, you know, there's something really valuable and poignant in terms of like the, the lived experience for all of us of that human connection. And I think there's a lot that we can continue to learn from Synanon, even though it's also a cautionary tale. Yeah. I hope that we don't um, summarize it in, in a way that makes people, um, I don't want to say fearful, but hesitant to really dig into it because it is a deep exploration that is a lot of, well, let's not do that again, but let's not give up on doing this kind of thing for each other. And you brought up the game and this this therapy session that they had. It seemed groundbreaking in the use of a group therapy session in that, in that way as well. And the... Um, emotion that that brought out in people, it seemed like you captured a lot of what came from that in your interviews. Rory, did you, was there a sense of overwhelm when you had to conduct these interviews with, with all of these folks who, who, I mean, you've interviewed a lot of people Were these, this uh, batch of folks as a group, were they more articulate or more expressive with their emotion than, than, others who hadn't been through something like this? They felt like they were professional talkers. <laughs> like they were really, mm. really good at talking, um, but not just, you know, speaking, but actually speaking. I mean, they were great for a, a documentarian because they're honest, they're reflective, they're, um, you know, they, explore ideas in a very deep way. 
they're uh, able to look back on their past selves and have insight. Um, and they all had really fantastic memories of what happened and what they lived through and what their experiences were like. I mean, I think that because the core of Synanon was the game and, you know, as we show in the series, the game started as these kind of one hour sessions three times a week, but then as with everything at Synanon, it was often taken to an extreme. And so then they evolved that to doing 24 hour sessions of talking and then eventually 72 hours of staying awake and this kind of deprivation and, and what they called the trip uh, because it kind of resembled being on LSD, I think in terms of what happened to you. Um, but, you know, so they were really good at it. I mean, they were fantastic. And I remember thinking after doing the first two or three interviews, like this could be a nine part series or a 12 part series. Cause there's, you know, there's so much, um, I mean, I think, I think the four hours is a, is a really good time frame for the film, but I do think that we had to make a lot of really hard choices, particularly with, characters who were endlessly fascinating and all going through their own journeys right and so with, there was opportunities to do kind of deeper dives into these individual stories um anyway yeah. okay well i'm gonna let that be the uh the uh, last thing that i ask of you rory but and our viewers know that we're big fans of you but now we're big fans of mark as well so uh, mark i want to close up by asking you did this story as it unfolded uh was it as you had envisioned when you when you embarked on the journey and pitched it um no it wasn't and i think that you know rory touched on some of that that um it was both in some ways more beautiful and meaningful what they had there. I mean, there was a part of me that's like, man, I would have liked a little time there. Like it was like that was real connection. And they had there was an intensity and there was, you know, this is obviously more in the in, sort of in the first half of its lifespan. So that aspect of the specialness um, was richer and more profound and then how wacky it got and you know i had re have resisted i don't say in in sort of the, the tagline i guess for the series is did the cure become a cult and there's a question mark and that was kind of part of our exploration and i don't know that i fully have answered that for myself but it was both more beautiful and then there was a lot of harrowing stuff that you kind of just can't ignore either that was, you know, deeply intense and upsetting. And, you know, I was surprised by that as well. So I think on both ends of the extreme. Well, let's uh, conclude by letting everybody know that it is deeply intense and you will be fascinated by it. And it's going to give you uh, some material that forces uh, some explorations in what you think about rehabilitation, what you think about addiction, what you think about quote unquote cults, and definitely what you think about charismatic leaders. And so Mark, Rory, we're, like I said, big fans of yours, and we want to have you on for anything that you're doing. Thank John, you. Pete, thank you for having us on Break It Down. It's great. So, and I appreciate all of your thoughtful questions. Always love Hey, thanks on. for watching the show. I really appreciate it. Right here, you can subscribe. Please do that. It makes the show grow. Hit that notification bell so you know which incredible guest is coming up next. Down below is the PayPal link. You can put a small subscription in. That is an enormous help. All that money goes right back into the show. And then right up over here are the next episodes you should listen to. Curated by yours truly. Thank you.